President Truman's hometown was settled by farmers in the late 20s and the early 30s of the last century. No doubt in the pioneer American way of the time, they were looking for a quiet haven beyond the elbow jostling of crowds. This is not what they got. Independence became, rapidly after its foundation, a jumping off place for the West. A noisy, busy, and somewhat turbulent frontier outfitting station. It mushroomed with blacksmith shops, wagon builders, and wheelwright sheds, stock traders' corral, general stores, gun shops, drug shops, and makeshift hotels. Milling in the new town streets were hunters, fur trappers of the high Rockies, fur merchants from St. Louis and Eastwood, Indians of adjacent areas, titled adventurers from cultured lands across the sea, soldiers, literary celebrities, Frenchmen, Germans, Mexicans, and above all, profit seekers of every shade and degree of honesty looking to the Indian trade or further to the Spanish trade of Santa Fe and Chihuahua. When the Oregon country beckoned in the early 1840s, the settlers poured through in one of the greatest migrations in history. For something over three decades, independence funneled through its streets and shops most of the expansionist energy of America, which, accelerated by the Jefferson administration's purchase in 1803 of the vast tract of Louisiana, began moving gropingly but irresistibly toward the shores of the Pacific Ocean. That independence should exercise a prime function in this movement was inevitable, for whether her founders knew it or not, they had established their town on ancient trails, though, over which for centuries buffalo and deer had made their seasonal passing, and over which, also for untold years, the Indians had marched their bartering and their war-making expeditions eastward and westward. Independence was located at a natural takeoff point for the overland routes to the southwest and the west. Before English-speaking peoples had reached the Mississippi, French and Spanish adventurers and hunters had discovered and used the relatively easy southwestward passages offered by the trail. After the accession of Louisiana, American explorers began probing these trails, organized mercantile expeditions to New Mexico, Santa Fe, and Taos, began passing now and then through or near the site of independence. Coinciding with these movements and a chief factor in forwarding the rapid growth of the town and in sustaining its historic functions came the development of effective steamboating on the Missouri River. Westward travelers, because of this, could move easily to the very head of the Plains Trail, so much more negotiable than most eastward. They could start the long part of the trek with fresh animals and sound wagons. So, set up at a strategic conjunction of river and trail, and at a time when American urges westward were reaching to climactic uh, proportions, it was given to independence to play a first and major part in the continental destiny of the United States. Now I'm going to tell you about the painting itself, the Nero painting, the Independence and the Opening of the West. It is too large for anything but generalized treatment in the space available. No specific events of written history are therefore represented, nor any of the specific individuals of the record. There are too many of both. In their place are symbolic figures, symbolic happenings, representing a multiplicity of real individuals and real events. For instance, your great-grandfather who went to the high western mountains and ought to be in the picture is not. 
Neither are his friends Kit Carson and Jim Bridger. In their place is a generalized hunter, trapper, and mountain man who stands for all three. The same goes for the other people and for the other things shown. In the area about and above the door are the chief opposing elements of the drama. Here are the Plains Indians against the hunter and the trapper and the French voyageur and the permanent settler who finally dispossessed the Indian. The prospective settler represented is placed in the important position directly above the door because it was he and she who set the seal of accomplished fact on our continental destiny. Traders, explorers, hunters, and adventurers marked the paths over which destiny took its course, but it was the settler who in the end was most consequential in establishing the United States we now know. All settlers, hunters, trappers, and traders of the West sooner or later came in direct contact with the Indians whose hunting lands they invaded. The Indians adjacent to the door are Pawnees. The Pawnees range from what is now Nebraska to the borders of present-day Oklahoma country. Their chief wealth was in horses. They were celebrated for their ability to steal them from other Indians as well as from the white folk. Travelers of the Plains Trails might well meet them first. They would be likely to appear friendly in the hope of picking up a little coffee or tobacco. And this is indicated by the offer of the pipe to the leader of the settler's train, which is coming to a halt for supper. The whites are suspicious, as they usually were with Indians, whose unpredictable behaviors, volatile temperaments, and ways of thinking they did not understand. Some justification of that suspicion is indicated by the Pawnee warrior in the foreground to the left of the door, who, though probably aware of the peaceful pipe offering, has ideas of his own. The Indians were individualistic and acted more frequently on purely personal initiative than the whites who traversed the prairies. The whites knew the value of disciplined, cooperative action. That is one reason why they dispossessed the Indians, even though obstreperous whites frequently enough forgot their group responsibilities. It was these latter who caused most of the Indian troubles, according to Josiah Gregg, the first historian of the Plains, and aside from President Truman, the most distinguished citizen of independence. The Pawnee in the full plane of the picture is equipped and painted for marauding action with a ready bow and arrow and the famous Pawnee lasso entwined about his waist. Opposite to him on the right side of the door is the Jim Bridger, Kit Carson, Jim Beckworth type of hunter, trapper, and mountain man who first scouted the pathways of the West. He would not make trouble with the Indians. Normally he gets along with them, but he would be ready as the dropping of his traps and the charging of his gun suggests for any troubles which might arise. He is a dead shot and like the Indians, inured to physical hardships. He is not merely an adventurer, but is, as we say, in business. He works at his beaver hunting and trapping for a profit but he usually expends this in a few wild days of hoopla with the whiskey kegs, gambling rings, and acquiescent young Indian squaws assembled by more calculating fur traders from independent St. Louis and eastward, who buy his hard-earned pelts at a fraction of their world market value. He it is who made possible the beaver fortunes of the Astors and other great and respectable notables of the 19th century. He himself is not notably respectable, but is nevertheless one of the stalwarts of our Western destiny. Above him is that other omnipresent actor on our Western trails, the French voyageur, boatman, axeman, mule skinner, and ox driver. Everywhere on the frontier, from Louisiana to Canada, he was the man of hard work, gay song, and perpetual good humor. 
His name is rarely known to record, but we owe more to him, perhaps, than to his celebrated countryman, Lafayette. In the foreground, to the right of the door, are shown the indispensable workers of an outfitting town such as was independent. The boy pulling the bellows rope in the blacksmith shop is not paid for his work. He is doing what all country town kids have always liked to do, including the artist. Beyond these, again to the right, indicating the direction of the trade which first built up the town, is a Mexican gentleman with his, at the moment, refractory riding mule. The oxen, led in back of the wheelwright, may be for sale or be simply on their way to the owner's wagon. In the rear, wagons form a train, the loaded ones moving out toward the prairie. Way back in the distance, showing that the wagons are headed for Oregon, are the famous landmarks of the Oregon Trail, Chimney and Courthouse Rocks in western Nebraska. To the left of the door, back of the Pawnee warrior, a trader displays his wares to a Cheyenne chief who has red fox furs to barter. Near the chief's hand is his rifle, a French flintlock, which has likely come west from New Orleans, its journey furthered perhaps by the introduction of an arrow to the body of its original owner. Back of the trader is the persuasive whiskey keg likely full of watered alcohol, pepper, and uh, tobacco juice. And back of that, a young Cheyenne squaw bringing in more fur to trade. Near her, pack mules are being reloaded for a further westward journey. There are tardy members of the mule train going over the hill. Above and to the left of the Cheyenne chief, a number of his young warriors show off their horsemanship no doubt stimulated by traders' beverages. Back of them is Fort Bent, a formidable adobe fortress set far out on the Santa Fe Trail along the banks of the Arkansas River in southern Colorado. Back of the fort are the Spanish Peaks, landmarks of the way to Taos and Santa Fe. The lower panels, right and left of the door, show independence in the late 1840s and the Missouri River landing where arrived most of the goods and peoples which changed independence from a quiet backwoods settlement to a gateway of destiny.